Put your hands together, thank God, make sure you do buy. Inside the bookshop, go get it. Please deal with the echo, please deal with the echo, deal with the echo. It's good to be with you, for every one of you here. It's good to have you, and those online, you are all welcome to a service already in motion. <laughs> Hallelujah. We want to pray right now that the Holy Spirit will have his way in today's service like never before. Let the Spirit of God brood upon this house. Let the Spirit of God awake, quicken, and resurrect. Let the Spirit of God inspire us right now as we put our hands together. Let's just pray that the Holy Spirit will do a new thing. Empower us. Change our lives. Impact our lives. Do a new thing. Is anybody praying? Hallelujah. With your hands lifted, say, Heavenly Father, once again, we have come. We've come to your feet, to the feet of the throne. We need you to inspire, illuminate, give us clarity, help us to make sense of the things we can't make sense of. Have your way. Oh, Spirit of the living God, brood over this gathering. Do a new thing. Set the captives free. Break every yoke. Set the captives free. The name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Put your hands together and give him praise. Once again, welcome to the house. You may be seated in heavenly places. We have some few VIPs and they'll be acknowledged after the service. But right now I want to talk to you about what I call tones in the flesh. Tones in the flesh. Tones in the flesh. And I want you also to note the fact that uh, one of the reasons why it's in your flesh and not in your spirit is because your flesh is not born again and will never be born again. Flesh is always going to be flesh. And the flesh is already condemned. And the flesh will only change, but it's not born again and cannot be born again. It cannot be born again. So the enemy will always try to access and attack and get at you through your flesh. Your greatest enemy and problem is not the devil or demons, it's your flesh. If you can't master this thing called the flesh, you will always struggle with the challenges of life. It's the greatest weapon the enemy deploys. And sometimes you don't have to really do anything about it, but the awareness gives you the upper hand. When you are aware that this is the greatest weapon of the enemy against me, using me against me, conflict within, fights within, you most times I said at the first service that anytime you feel like you are having issues with others, first of all, you have to look within. You take a time to look at yourself. Always look at yourself. And you realize that most of the time the problem is not others, but the problem is you. It's right within you. Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh, but don't have anything in me. Because if he doesn't have anything in you, he has no power over you. His power over you is what he has in you. Because he must deploy what is in you to get at you. If he can, and if he doesn't have anything in you, he can win over you. He has to find something within you, your bloodline, in order to get at you. Tons in the flesh. Come with me, please, to the book of Genesis 3, 17 to 19. The first time we heard about tons, in the Bible, but Genesis 3, 17 to 19.
had to do with Adam and Eve. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Remember that the ground was cursed. Adam and Eve was not cursed. Cursed went to the ground, not on Adam and Eve, but the ground. Remember that. Go ahead. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Mm -hmm. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So you see the thorn here is designed to torture to restrict, to limit, and to provoke, to vex, to make life, environment, difficult, uncomfortable, unbearable. And that is what Tony is designed to do to individuals, to people, if it's not dealt with and if you don't acknowledge it. There are so many people who think and believe that because God said to Paul that my grace is sufficient for you, that people should just endure a thorn. Not so, not so. It, it, when we look at the scripture carefully, God said that my grace is sufficient for you means that you have the capability to deal with it. So you can either uproot, deal with it, or you can live with it. That means you can enjoy it or you can get rid of it. So it all depends on what you want, but you have what it takes. The thorn cannot stop you from finishing your course. It can't stop you from doing what I call you to do. It can limit you. It can restrict you. And it can make life unbearable and uncomfortable. It can vex you. It can provoke you. You always find yourself dealing with something, but it can't stop your assignment. It can't stop your mission, but it's your decision. You have what it takes. My grace, the capability to handle it, address it, master it, deal with it, or endure it. That is your decision and your choice. Some choose to just live with it, endure it, and just believe that, you know what? It's my cross. No, I don't believe in it's my cross. But if that is what you believe, is done according to your faith. Be it done according to your faith. So it has to do with your understanding, revelation of God, and your relationship with God and where you stand when it comes to your relationship with God. Put your hands together and say, I hear you. Okay, come with me to 2 Corinthians 12. 7 to 10. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Uh -huh. The messenger of Satan buffet me, mm -hmm. lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, so it's very, very clear that he's torn here. Some people believe that the torn of Paul was his wife. Uh, they give all kinds of, but it's very clear that the thorn here was an infirmity. An infirmity could have been a weakness, a particular type or kind of a weakness, a disease, and something that was very clear. When we go to Galatians, you see it was very, very clear that there was something Paul was dealing with, but God said to him that you have the capability to handle this thing and you can finish your course and it won't stop you from finishing your course. And, but the decision then is left to the individual what you're going to do with it, whether you are going to apply the grace given unto you to tackle it, to deal with it, or by grace you are just going to live with it and enjoy it. But that is a decision an individual has to make. Please understand that you are not Paul the Apostle. And you are not given the abundance of revelation that was given to Paul. And your assignment is different from Paul's assignment. Your, your tongue or your infirmity is different from that of mine. Everybody that is in this flesh 
God, the human body, will deal with something until you die. You are going to have to deal with something and we have to develop compassion one with another because the fact that you don't have a weakness for alcohol does not mean you don't have weakness or infirmity for something else. You may not have a weakness or a problem with alcohol like someone else, but you are also dealing with something. Everybody is dealing with something. So you don't have to look down on someone that is struggling with alcohol or struggling with nicotine or struggling with something because everybody is dealing with something. So you have to develop compassion. That's what the Bible says, pray one with another that you may be healed. That's what the Bible says, judge not that you may not be judged. So don't be a judge over anybody. Don't be critical of people. Learn to be compassionate. Learn to be understanding. Learn to be kind. Learn to be gentle and kind to others because everybody, including yourself, is dealing with something. Put your hands together and give God praise. I was saying in the first service that most time when when a wife complains that my husband is not nice to me, he's always moody, he's always down and he's dead. The man may have a problem of depression. He's dealing with depression and meanwhile, you are blaming yourself for his depression when it is his own problem. He needs therapy. He needs deliverance. He needs help. Don't take responsibility of his depression and stop blaming yourself and you think, you know what? I got to do something about my body. So you go and you cut this side. And he's still depressed. He says, it's my stomach. You go and do something, shrink your stomach. And the guy is still depressed. You say, my nose is too big. So you go and you cut down the nose. And the guy is still depressed. So I got to do something about my eyelids. So you go and you do all kinds of things and you shoot some arrows on your eyelids. And the guy still can't see because he has a depression problem. You know something? It's not you. It's him. And there are, there are, there are wives that are cold like a piece of wood. Don't move. Don't show any affection in bed. They just lie down there like a piece of wood, cold like ice water. Don't show any emotion or feelings. And the man thinks, what's wrong with me? I don't know what to do. I've tried everything. I'm not getting any affection or anything. Brother, you better pray in the Holy Ghost and, and activate, activate the Spirit of God within you. Because you see, if that woman is dealing with some kind of a childhood kind of a problem, a childhood kind of experience or trauma they have, and it hasn't been healed and cured and dealt with, you can change it. Viagra will not stir anything up. Cialis won't do anything. You got to cast out that demon and get her healed because she's sick. Her emotions are damaged and she needs healing. So stop blaming yourself and thinking that I don't know what to do. She's never satisfied. She's never fulfilled. I've tried everything. Stop worrying your head. Pray for her healing. Pray for her recovery. Take anointing oil when she's not around. Go stand by her bedside. Anoint her bed and say, I command some fire and some romance and some affection on my bed, on this side of the bed, in the middle of the bed, on the pillow. Command light. Prophesy on that bed and stop complaining and take responsibility and feeling bad about somebody's problem. Hello? Why you look at me that way? Today, it looks like everybody in the church is holy, righteous, and an angel. Is there any human beings here? Well, if you're a human being, put your hands together and give God some praise. But, but Paul recognized that the messenger of Satan, which was a thorn, was given to his flesh. It was assigned to his flesh, not his spirit, but the flesh. Because your flesh is not born again. And it's never going to be born again. It will change when Jesus comes through resurrection. But till then, the enemy is going to always attack. And use your flesh to get at you. A turn in the flesh. And he said, as anointed as he was, he raised the dead. Paul raised the dead. He sweat the aprons, the hankies from his body. Heal people. And he was preaching and somebody died. 
and he stopped the preaching, resurrected the guy, went back to preaching. This was how Paul, powerful Paul was. And yet he had an infirmity. Come with me to Galatians. Look at Galatians. He had an infirmity. He had a weakness. He had a struggle. Galatians 4, 13 to 15. He had a weakness. He had a struggle. You know how through infirmity of, my, of the flesh. He, read it again. Again. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel of Jesus. You see, he said, Christ. through an infirmity of my flesh, I had a weakness. I had a challenge. There was a situation. It was in my flesh. And yet it did not stop me from preaching the gospel. And sometimes some of you look at men of God who are anointed. Hear me. It doesn't matter whether you are an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a teacher, an archbishop, a pope. Don't matter who you are. As long as you are in this flesh, you're going to deal with some tongues. You're going to deal with some infirmity. Is anybody hearing me? Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. And Paul said, I had an infirmity in my flesh. Go ahead. But I preach. And my temptation which was in the, my flesh, you despise not. He said, he said, I had a temptation in my flesh. And yet, I kept preaching the word and you did not reject me or despise me. Because you know what the challenge is? They said to Jesus, if you be the son of God, you save others, save yourself. Save your children. Save your loved ones. Save your wives. I had a prophet friend of mine called Michael McCann, very short guy. He used to come to this church 30 years ago plus. And this guy was bad. One time, I was in London, in Kessington Town Hall, and he walked in, and he said, the Lord told me in my hotel, he's going to shrink somebody. I was sitting at the back there and I said, whoa, that is heavy. I said, Lord, you shrink people? That's a big business. You got a shrinking anointing to shrink people, let them lose weight, feel good about themselves. And I said, wow, this guy, this guy is really anointed. If he can shrink people here, all the women in town will go after him. So he came around, he started preaching. Then he got to a point, he stopped. And he said, he walked to about the fifth lane. He said, there's a lady sitting there. The lady stood up and she was about 300 and something pounds, huge. And he said, the Lord is going to shrink you. Do you like that? And he laughs and plays with it. And he said, follow me, follow me. Brought the lady to the front. And then he stood there. He said, angel of the Lord, angel of the Lord. Touch. Then he said, the fire of God, fire of God. Burn the fire, burn the fire. And the lady began to shrink. I said, whoa. I said, this is heavy. I want some of this. And I was sitting at the back there, a young preacher from Ghana. And he said, there's a young preacher from Ghana here sitting at the back and you are talking to the Lord about me and what's going on. I said, I like this guy. He's going to be my friend. So after we met, we became friends and he used to come here a lot. Now, Michael McCann prayed for so many people who had babies, people who couldn't have kids, people who were barren. He prophesied about my sons and everything before they were born. I mean, this dude was no joke. And yet he never had kids. He never had children the rest of his life. He passed. He never had children. That never stopped him. It never stopped him from praying for others from having kids. Are you hearing me, somebody? And sometimes people can question you and say, but if he is a man of God, that's what they said to Jesus, if thou be the son of God, you save others. Come down the cross and save yourself. And sometimes it's like you are touching people's children. You are delivering other people's kids. You are performing these wonders, miracles. You are healing others. Heal yourself. Hear me. The anointing is not for your personal benefit. It's for the benefit and the use of others. And Paul said, I had an issue. I had an infirmity. I had a weakness. I had a situation. But you see, he said, in my weakness is his strength made manifest. God has chosen weaker vessels, foolish things of this world to confound the wife, uh, the wise. And God does it so that everybody will know that it is God and not you. And that was Paul's problem. God didn't give him the messenger of Satan, but God allowed it. 
the demons here. And I told you something last week, Sunday, that when you go to a football park and a match, the captains of each team will tell their people, watch number seven, watch number eight. They are strikers. If they get the ball, we're in trouble. Make sure they don't get the ball. And if they get the ball, stop them, break their leg, do everything. They are strikers. They have potential. They are dangerous. And then anyone who you see with the ball, make sure you get the ball out of their hands and they don't get to the post. And the problem here is so many of you don't understand why you go through so many things. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, since my battle began from my mother's womb, and I said, for me, I fought for everything. It hasn't been like for others. Others just get it. I pray for others and they make it. The other day, Paul said, we have made you rich, but we are poor. Yeah. Through our messages and anointing on our lives, we make many people rich and better. And there are plenty. And we still don't have what they have, even though they got it through us. <clears throat> But you got to understand how the principles work here. And you have to be very careful that you don't judge people based on their infirmity. And Paul said, go back to Galatians. And my temptation which was in my flesh you despised not. Which was in my flesh you despised not. Nor rejected. Nor rejected. But received me as an angel of God. But you received me as an angel of the Lord. Even as Christ Jesus. Even like Christ Jesus. Even though I had weakness. I had issues. And, and that is the trick of the enemy because the purpose of the thorn in his flesh was to buffet him, to limit him, to restrict him so he doesn't perform at maximum potential. To make sure that he's not himself and he's not his best. And he said, I had a struggle and you knew my weakness. You knew I had an infirmity and yet you treated me as Christ and as an angel of the Lord. You didn't despise me. And you see what the, the enemy is so very good. I preached a message some years ago and I said, God said to Paul, he said, I will deliver you from the people to whom I have assigned to you so that they will accept your message. And one of the things the enemy does is to activate an infirmity, a thorn, something in your own blood to follow you. And you see, Peter denied Christ three times. And at the same place he denied Christ, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost came upon him, he has to stand in the same place and confess the same person he denied and betrayed. So one of the things the enemy does is to discredit you to the people you are called to touch so that they will not accept your message. That's what the Bible says, a prophet is without honor in his own town. Because you are called to touch your own people. But because they know your background, they said, is it not the son of the carpenter? Is it not the son of Joseph? How dare you come here and be talking to us about the mysteries of God? Working miracles. We know you. We know your father, Mary. If, uh, Joseph, your mother, Mary. You a carpenter. The father is a carpenter. How dare you come here to say you're a prophet? We know everything about your background. But Paul said, even though, even though you had knowledge of who I was or I am and my background and you could see my infirmity. So the Bible didn't tell us exactly what the infirmity was, whether he was leaping like Jacob. Jacob leaped. But whatever it was, it was clear that the people knew of it. And yet they did not allow that infirmity to stop them from receiving from that vessel. Are you hearing me, somebody? your ability to overlook the shortcomings of others and look at the good they bring to the table determines your maturity. I have learned not to despise people and to look down on people because you never know who God can use to bless you. I'm telling you, you never know. I've been in situations and some of the people who helped me were not rich and mighty people. I said the other day that the greatest gift I've had in ministry for 45 years did not come from a believer. It came from an atheist. 
an unbeliever. Believers that are blessed, impacted their life, that they've made it billionaires, huge guys. They never have never gone out of that way and bless me to say thank you, Papa, for letting God use you. Like an unbeliever, an atheist, he said, I'll watch you over the years. You've made a believer out of me. I want to help your ministry. Paul said, don't be ashamed of me because of my bounds, my chains. And I want to look at some few characters in the Bible who had some serious thorns, infirmities. Take Abraham, for instance. He was a friend of God, the father of faith, and there were three problems in the bloodline, in the DNA of Abraham. Number one, there was a problem of lying. Two, fear. Three, they had a weakness for fair women. three problems. And Abraham had it. Isaac had it. Jacob had it. And it went through the bloodline all the way to David. Belsheba. And then he moved from David to Solomon. Thou art fair. Oh my. Let me not go there. I'll stop here. Ring the song of, ring the song of Solomon. You'll see. Ferris of Mr. Counselor. Give me some. Bishop. Uh -huh. Thou art fair, O oh my beloved. And he ended up with 1,000 women. Where did he come from? Genesis 12. His great grandfather. And that was the torn. That was the weakness. That was the infirmity in the bloodline. And every family has a familiar spirit. And your torn is not my torn. And that spirit will always reveal and expose and bring to bear at your Kairos moment in life, at your time and point of breakthrough. He brings it up as an objection to stop you from getting to the first, next level. And he can use anything. So in the family of Abraham, it was lies, fear, and fair women. Then you move away. You come to the son of Abraham. Isaac had the same problem. Look at the scripture. Come with me. Let, let's look at some scriptures quickly. Before we get there, let's finish with the tones. Numbers 33, 55. Numbers 33, 55. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before If you don't drive it out. So there are things if you don't deal with it. You see, Childhood traumas. Childhood traumas that are not addressed, dealt with, confronted, becomes adulthood giants. The snake in the book of Genesis that was not dealt with became a dragon in the book of Revelation. So whatever it is, we need to lay the axe to the root and cut it off now because you see history always repeats itself on a higher plane. And I pray that your past will not compromise your future. In Jesus' name. Go ahead. Then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your you eyes. See, so he said, whatever you, you don't deal with, you don't confront, you don't address it, and you leave it, will grow to fight for you and the next generation in the future. Go ahead. There shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side. Plagues in your eyes and thorns in your... In your side. Side. Mbe. Somebody say Mbe. That is in one of the languages of Ghana. Ga, Ga. And then in three they said Nkase, Nkase. Look at it. It's serious. And it shall vex you in the land. It where will vex run. you in the land. Torture you. Torment you. Harass you. Make life unbearable and uncomfortable. Always dealing with something. Always struggling with something. It's designed to limit you. It's designed to affect your concentration. So you can focus and you can concentrate to function. Because concentration is the womb of accomplishment. 
Go ahead. Yeah, we are through with that. Look at another scripture. Come with me to Matthew 27, 29 to the 30th verse, then the 40th verse to the 42 verse. And when they had planted a crown of thorns, uh -huh. they laid it upon his head uh -huh. and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, uh -huh. Hail, King of the Jews. They, and mocked, this, they mocked him. They crowned him. They put on his head a crown of thorns. What was the purpose of that? Mockery. Say, I rebuke the spirit of mockery. See, I will not be mocked in the name of Jesus. Say, the church will not be mocked in the name of Jesus. Say, my family will not be mocked in the name of Jesus. But you see, one of the purposes of these thorn is to create a situation of mockery. Like they said to Jesus, if thou be the son of God, you save others, save yourself. If what you are preaching works, let's see the manifestation in your own life. That's why Paul said, we've made you rich and we are poor. So you can be preaching and still have issues. As we go around, I'll show you scriptures. So the fact that you're anointed and you're a man of God don't mean you're not going to have challenges. You have challenges. I went to do a pro, I went to do, went to the state some years ago and I did a procedure and they said, I had ulcer. And I said, no, I don't. And the doctor said, I'm sorry, you have to live on medication the rest of your life. You can't fast. And I said, the devil is a liar. Somebody said, the devil is a liar. Say, say with an attitude and a passion like me, the devil is a liar. So I came back, I took communion, I drank anointing oil, I lay my hands on my stomach, I said, you demon of all, sir, there is no room and place here for you. Come out in the name of Jesus. Lay hands on my stomach night and day, and I kept screaming, and sometimes Rosa would say, are you okay? I said, I'm very okay. Because I was screaming, commanding it, come out. Somebody say, out, out, out. And they said, six months after, come back. After six months, I went back. And they did the same procedure. They knocked me out. When I came back, they said, interesting. What did you do? And I said, why? They said, there is a scar in your stomach that proves that you had ulcer, but it's been healed because the scar is there. Are you hearing me, somebody? Then I did my blood works recently. And then my doctor called me and said, you have to come in immediately. And I don't like that. So I went and I said, what is it? He said, something is wrong here. All the blood work is not good. Everything is gone off. And I said, it is not my blood. He said, what are you talking about? I said, it's not my blood. I said, look at the history. Go a month, two, three months ago. Go back. Check it. And I said, all the things cannot change like that. This is not my blood. It's a sabotage. It's a projection. I said, it's a manipulation. Somebody wants to put fear in me. It's not my blood. Somebody say, it is not my blood. So I said, repeat the test. And I want the test to go to other places. So they did it. I said, go back to the same place and go to other places, let's check. And then when they finished pulling the blood, you see the first time he just pulled the blood and I took things for granted. This second time, when he pulled the blood, I said, give me my blood. He said, well, I said, just give me the container. My blood is my blood, give it to me. So I took it and I held it in my heart and I said, in the name of Jesus. I said, I said, my blood, I'm speaking to you. There will be no manipulation this time, no projection. No one with an evil eye will look at you. Nobody with an evil hand will touch you. I block evil eyes, block any evil eye. And I said, I send prayer to the laboratory, to the lab, into the machines and those handling the diagnosis, whatever. And I said, I command the right diagnosis. I command a favorable result and report. In the name of, I block, reject, override, overrule, neutralize, overturn, command to boomerang, anything they will project through my blood. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Fear comes by hearing, and hearing from the devil. And I say, I'm not bringing me any negative report. My blood, do you hear me? In the name of Jesus. And the guy was looking at me, and I knew what he was thinking. 
yeah, the way he looked at me, I can tell that he was thinking that this guy, something is off out there. And I said to myself, I don't care what you think is my blood. I will speak to my blood. I will bless my blood. I will prophesy to my blood. After three days, my doctor called me and said, we have to talk. And then I sent the report to three other doctors out of Ghana, North America, for them to look at the first one and the three other re results. And other ones they didn't do. I said, check everything. Check hormones, check everything. So he came back. They all called me and said, there's a contradiction here. We don't understand. There's such a vast difference between the first and the second. The, this, one, this one agrees with all the last three months. We don't get it. And I said, you don't get what? It's a projection. Manipulation. Ill wills. Evil imagination. Evil expectations. Some people want something bad to happen. I command it to backfire. Somebody say, backfire, backfire. Put your hands and say, backfire in the name of Jesus. Backfire. Hallelujah. Say amen. Everybody is dealing with something. You know, if you look at the scriptures because of time, I'll give you the scriptures later. Moses. God said Moses was the meekest man in all the earth. In all the earth. And meekness means power under control. And yet Moses had uncontrollable anger. And Bishop James, when his anger comes, he doesn't think. When his anger comes, he does everything foolish. The first manifestation of his anger, he destroyed the first ten commandments. As a matter of fact, before even then, he killed an Egyptian. He was vexed and he killed an Egyptian. And even if you look at the situation with the Ten Commandments, check it out for me. He said, and I was exceedingly angry, vexed, and he destroyed the first commandment. Then the third time, God said, speak to the rock. Give my people water to drink. He insulted the people and he used his rod and he struck the rock. And God said, Charlie, what is this? This is uh, some familiarity. You've crossed certain lines. So come home. The same man, how can a man be the meekest man on all the earth? And yet, Bishop had an uncontrollable anger. That uncontrollable anger was not him. It was from the grandfather, Levite. Levite and Simeon went to the village where their sister was raped and had a covenant with the men of that city and the prince that they want all the men of that city to be circumcised and after that they can marry the sister I think it was Keshin or so Dinah, yeah Dinah by the name of the city yeah, she Shekin, Shekin look at the Genesis on the third day they went in and they killed all the men of the city including the prince and when Jacob heard it he cursed their anger he said curse be your anger and my soul shall not enter into your habitation or into your tent. That anger was in the DNA and that was the turn of that bloodline. And even though Moses was the meekest, anytime the devil wanted to fool with him and mess him up, all he did was to activate it. And that is what you call a besetting sin. Things you do without thinking. When that thing is provoked and is activated, and it's triggered. It's like you are under anesthesia. You don't know what you are doing. After you've done it, then you come to yourself. That's what you call besetting sin. Read. Look at it. Read. Genesis, Genesis 49, 7. Cares be their anger, for uh -huh. it was fierce. fierce. And they are rough, for it was cruel. Uh -huh. I will divide them in Jacob uh -huh. and scatter them Israel. Curse be their anger. Yeah. And their wrath. For it was fierce. That was Moses. And Moses wasn't a Moses wasn't an ordinary guy. God said about Moses. He said, 
If there is anyone that calls himself a prophet among you, I, the Lord, speak to them through dreams and vision. But as for Moses, my servant, I speak to him face to face. A man that speaks to Adonai, that speaks to the living God, Yahweh, the God of the armies of Israel, he spoke to God face to face and had a tongue. What was this? Uncontrollable anger. Where was it coming from? In the blood. Say in the blood. In the blood. Somebody talk to me. Say in the blood. Say in the DNA. It's in the DNA. When you go to the doctors to see them, they give you a form to fill. One of the things they do is to investigate to find out if in, in your bloodline or your family, anybody have particular illnesses or diseases. They do an investigation. All truth is parallel. And what you are doing is to find out what is it that exists in your bloodline to try and predict what's going on or what will happen to check it. It's the same thing in the spirit world. Same thing. That you see Abraham lied because he was afraid and because his wife was fair. Isaac lied because he was afraid and because his wife was fair. He travels through the bloodline. And that same thing moves from one generation to another. I had a lady in this church years ago. He dated four men and they all died. So I told him, I said, you have a killing spirit, girl. Stop dating men. She said, what do I do? I said, you need deliverance. Yeah, we need to take you to deliverance. So stop all these things you are doing. You need deliverance. And I said, if any brother tried to be nice to you, do this. Mm. Scare them away. Because if they come close, they'll die. I had a situation some years ago where a young man in this church, he married this lady. And he told the mother, he said, Mom, Mom, every night somebody beats me. Since I married, every night a man, a giant will come and beat him. He wakes up weak, tired, always beaten. So the mother and I said, ask the boy's mother about the circumstances surrounding the pregnancy and the birth of the child. And the mother said, yeah, 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 you know, I wasn't getting pregnant. So they took her to some shrine in their village and they went to this river and gave her some concussion and the water to drink and when she had the baby, they named the child after the god of that village. And apparently there were things that were required and she wouldn't do it. If you go for anything from the devil, you have to fulfill the requirements because Satan, he doesn't forgive. And number two, if you go and take anything from Satan, he becomes your father-in-law. And so they, they beat him all the time. I saw him doing my birthday and I, he was so happy. And I said, hey son, how are you? How is your wife? He said, I've run away. I said, so how are you doing? He said, they're not beating me anymore. I ran away, so they stopped beating me. But there are things. There are things. So even though you're a believer, you speak in tongues, I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, there are things that, unless the Holy Spirit makes you aware of it, the enemy can use it against you. Yeah. A crown of tongues. Crown of tongues. To torture you mentally. Mental torture. Mental bombardments. You can't think right. You can't make the right decisions. It's like your thoughts are all over the place. You are being mentally afflicted. Today in the name of Jesus, we block every spirit of mental affliction. I said we block mental affliction. We command everyone suffering from mental afflictions and oppression. Be loose in the name of Jesus. Put your hands together. Command the healing and the freedom. Mental affliction. In the name of Jesus. We bind it in the name of Jesus. Is somebody praying? Hallelujah. Let me show you a scripture. Come with me to 2 Kings, the 13th chapter and the 14th verse. You can be anointed and still have a tongue. 
and still have an infirmity and still deal with a weakness. The Bible says, you know something that amazes me, Bishop James? The Bible said Jesus was tempted at every point that we are tempted, but he was without sin. So every temptation we go through from women to drugs to name it, lying, whatever, the Bible said Jesus was tempted at all those points, but yet he was without sin. And one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why the enemy, Jesus, you see, Jesus said something. He said, the prince of this world cometh, but nothing in me. You know why? Because you can't trace the blood of Jesus to any human being. You can't trace his blood to Adam or to Joseph. When it comes to the blood of Jesus, it came from heaven. The enemy could not access his blood. No familiar spirit could access the blood of Jesus. You can't decode that blood because the Bible said the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. So the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood was shed before the foundation of the earth and God kept that blood and when the right time came, he transported that blood from eternity into time to deal with the issues of men and you can't trace his blood. There was nothing in his blood that the earth could touch. Nothing. The blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Yeah, oh, the blood of Jesus. Yeah, what? Yeah, snow. And what can make me whole again? Yeah, nothing. Sing it now. That can make me whole again like the blood of Jesus because there is no sin in his blood you can't trace his blood to Adam all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God he couldn't sin because there was no sin in his blood that's why you have to learn to take communion every day but there's something about taking communion where you invite you invoke and infuse the zoe and the very life of God into your blood to allow the life of God to override your life something about the blood of Jesus that's why he speaks better things than the blood of Abel no sin, no iniquity no unrighteousness in his blood that's why we call it precious blood I'm redeemed by the blood of the lamb See, I'm redeemed. I'm the redeemed. I'm redeemed. See, I'm redeemed. I'm the redeemed of the Lord. I'm redeemed by the blood. Say by the blood. I'm purchased by the blood. I am the redeemed of the Lord. I'm redeemed by the blood. I'm purchased 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 by the blood. I
Your sickness is not my sickness. Your thorn is not my thorn. Your infirmity is not my infirmity. Your pain is not my pain. But the fact that you are stronger where I'm weak does not mean you are better than I. Because there is a strong possibility that you are weak where I'm stronger. So at the end of the day, you need me and I need you. At the end of the day, you need to pray for me and I have to pray for you. At the end of the day, you need to develop compassion and I need to develop compassion. That's why we must pray one for another. And that's why the Bible says, judge no one until the coming of the Lord. And judge not that you may not be judged. And it doesn't matter the struggle anyone has. God still uses weaker vessels. And those of you who have de who have determined and have also come up with standards by which God should use anybody, you are sick. Because if you really know God, he really doesn't use perfect people. If you go to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, I had some issues with God there. Because when I look at somebody like Samson and his name is in Hebrews 11, it's a contradiction. Samson in Hebrews 11, what is his name doing there? And then Rahab, Rahab, the harlot of Jericho. Rahab, the harlot of Jericho. The lady slept with everybody in town. Her name is in Hebrews 11. I said, God, why? Why, why now? This is a contradiction. Rahab in Hebrews 11, doing what? And this is for all you holiness people. Look at 2 Kings 20 and 21 of chapter 13. Uh -huh. And Elisha died and they buried him and the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming of the year. And it came to pass as they were burying a man that behold, they spied a band of men and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Can you believe that? The Bible said, Elijah died by his sickness. So he had an infirmity. He had a situation that he lived with. He allowed it. He could have dealt with it because there was enough power. He raised the dead, the Shunammite woman's son. He raised the dead. And in his bones was an anointing to raise the dead. And yet, he lived with the sickness and the sickness killed him. And years after, when they took a dead body and put it in the same grave, the bones of the dead man resurrected the dead. What was the power to raise the dead doing in the bones of the dead prophet? What am I saying here? That the anointing of God is not for your personal benefit. It's for the benefits of others. So you can be carrying power and the anointing of God and still struggle with things. And that is what proves that you are but a man and you are not God. You have to develop the faith to deploy that power for your own benefit. But it's not for your benefit, it's for the benefit of others. So people can be anointed, like Jesus on the cross. Save yourself if you're a son of God. Why don't you save your children? Why don't you save your loved ones? Speak wicked with. He went to preach. When he came back, the wife had died. So he resurrected the wife. He resurrected her. He brought her back to life. And the Lord said, Smith, let her go. Let her go. And he said, Lord, why? He said, this is the best time for her to go. If you don't let her go now, it will interrupt a lot of things. It's the best time for her to go. So let her go. Is anybody hearing me? Come with me. Come with me. Look at some scripture. I've mentioned it, but Genesis 12, 13, 22, 26, 6 and 7. Look at it. Say, I pray thee, mm -hmm. 
thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, mm -hmm. and my soul shall live because of thee. Mm -hmm. 20 verse 2. Mm -hmm. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerah, sent and took Sarah. 26, 6 and 7. And Isaac dwelt in Gerah. And the men of the place asked him of his wife. And he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say she is my wife. Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill him to kill me for Rebekah. Because she was fair to look upon. So that was the problem. <clears throat> Father had that weakness. Son had it. If you look at jo Jacob, Jacob had two wives, Rachel and Leah. Rachel and Leah. He served seven years for Rachel, and at the appointed time, the father manipulated the whole thing and gave him Leah. Now, this was my problem, Bishop. He's been with Rachel for seven years, and he went to bed with Leah the whole night until the morning, and he didn't know it was Leah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know that when the father was blessing Jacob, he didn't know it was Jacob. He played the father and the father-in-law also played him. You reap what you saw. But that is not just the point. The fact that he could sleep with her all night long and didn't know what he was sleeping with meant that the father-in-law drowned him. Omano Pito. He drank something. Yeah. Heavy gin. Now, you say, how do you know that? You remember Lot, two daughters. Yeah. They realized that there were no men around. So, one of them gave his father heavy alcohol. And the old man was drunk when he was under influence of alcohol. The firstborn slept with the father. Then the second day, the firstborn told the younger one, give him something to drink and you to go in. So both of them drank their father and went to bed with the old man. And all night, because few things here, he married in the night. That was lack of light, illumination. He didn't have enough light when he was marrying her. Two, there was a veil. So he didn't see what he was marrying. Three, because of the time, the night, and the alcohol influence, he slept with something he didn't know what he was sleeping with. Can you sleep with something you don't know? Yes! Yes. And the Bible said, and when the morning came, that means when the light came, when he had illumination, then he realized that it wasn't Rachel, but it was Leah. So he screamed and said, hey, my man, bro. And he went to the father-in-law and said, what have you done to me? Why did you do this to me? You played me. And I could hear the father-in-law saying, son, you played your father. I played you. Tell somebody, don't play your father. Don't play your father. Is anybody hearing me? Everybody... As long as you are in this flesh, you deal with something. Say, I hear you. Somebody say, talk to me. Am I talking to somebody? Hallelujah. Okay, come with me. I want to show you two scriptures and we'll close. Genesis 13, 14 to 15. I want to show you something. And the Lord went up to Abraham after that Lot was separated from him. After? Lot was separated After? From him. Lot was separated. After Lot was separated from him. You see, the word Lot means a veil, and it can also mean a tongue. Because as long as Lot was in Abraham's life, he never heard from God. God ignored him. Why? Because there was a tongue. There was somebody in his life who was not good for him. And that prevented God from talking and prevented him from hearing God. And the Bible said, but after that Lord had separated from Abraham, today I command divine separations. I command you to be separated from every Lord and from every tongue say yes.
Go ahead, listen. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto him, Lift up now thine eyes. You see, you will not hear him until you are separated from something. He said, Be ye separated from among them, and I'll be your God and you'll be my people. Then the Lord spoke and said, Lift up thine eyes here, not from Europe, not from Dubai, not from North America, but from where thou art. Go ahead. And look from the place where thou art northward. From where you are standing, right here in Ghana, right in Accra. Stop telling me that it's only strangers who come here and prosper. It doesn't matter what the situation is. You know, I was dealing with a situation some years ago, and I was always, I was blaming some particular individuals that they weren't showing appreciation and gratitude to me. And the Lord says, son, the problem is not them, it's you. And I said, me, what have I done? He said, there is something fighting you that is preventing them from appreciation. So deal with it. So I went into prayer. And I said, in the name of Jesus, any calculation and any manipulation and programming in the womb of the enemy and, the, and in the womb of time that influences people to pay me good for evil. In the name of Jesus, I terminate and abort. I intercept and override in the name of Jesus. And I lose appreciation into motion. It wasn't long. All three of them called me. Papa, we thank God for you. Papa, we want to send you something. Papa, we really thank God. And it was amazing how nice they became. And the issue was not them. It was something that was fighting me. Before you blame others and attack others and think that people are not treating you fairly, they are not handling you well, before you attack your government and begin to blame people in authority, I'm telling you, if you deal with whatever tone it is in this land, that deny the sons and daughters of this land of their portion in the land, people in authority will go out of their way to be nice to you. I'm telling you. Are you clapping? Yeah. So God said, God said, look from the place where thou art not from where you are. Hear me, your breakthrough is not in America. It's not in Europe. It's not in foreign investors. Your breakthrough is right here. But unless you deal with that which is blocking and preventing you, you can go to America and to follow you there. I'm telling you. I've seen people live in America 40 years, 30 years, and don't have papers and are struggling. Can't even buy a ticket to come back home because the thing is following them there. I had this pastor I used to travel with me. Anytime... We got to our destination. Everybody's luggage will come. Only him, his luggage will be sent to somewhere else. And you have to buy him things. Then the day we are leaving, they'll deliver his suitcase. So one day I said, Wafa, why? Why is it that any time we travel, your luggage don't come till we are leaving? He said, Papa, my family, eh? nobody has sat in a plane before. I'm the first to sit in a plane. Then I said, what does that, that has to do with your suitcase? He said, the demons in my family, because they can't stop me, they are stopping my bag. But as funny as it is, it is what it is. Are you hearing me? Somebody, somewhere, unseen, unknown, don't want you to succeed. I had a preacher friend of mine, he was a holiness preacher, very good guy. He married a woman who had lost two of her husbands. The first man died. The second husband died. Nice lady, so they married. He told me something very strange. People didn't know this. He said, the first week they married, he saw himself fighting with this huge snake in his garden. They were fighting. But he said, he didn't overcome the snake, and the snake didn't overcome him, but they fought. Few years after, I heard that he was having issues with women sleeping around. And I tried to engage him 
And I realized that because they couldn't kill him, they have to investigate the bloodline and find something in the bloodline that they can activate to use it to destroy the marriage. Cut a long story short, after some few years, the marriage didn't work and the lady became single again. What, what was the problem here? <clears throat> She's not meant to marry. She's designed by a programming from her bloodline not to marry. So whoever marries that woman, you have to be very anointed and strong in the spirit to be able to override that snake. If you are not strong and anointed and you marry her, that snake will do you in. He will. I had another friend. He said, Nick, pray with me. Anytime I have a business idea to do something and I tell my wife, as soon as I tell my wife, the whole thing fails. So I said, stop telling her. He said, but that is not honesty. I said, my friend, be wise. Be wise. And so he stopped telling her things and things were moving. Why? Because there was something working against her to make sure that her husband becomes a failure. When you go to America, you find so many African-American men in prison, in jail. And if you look at it carefully, you realize that there are some women, if you marry them, you will either fail or you go to prison or you die prematurely. I'm just telling you. You can look at me any way you... I'm a spiritual man. I've seen things and I know things. I'm telling you. And there are some men to where you marry them. If you are not prayerful, some things will happen to you that you will ask yourself, what happened? But it's because something is following them to make sure they fail. I've seen situations. I was dealing with a, a friend of mine in California. And we were praying for him in Ghana here. And I called him. I said, has anybody in your bloodline killed somebody before? He said, I can't talk on the phone. When are you coming to California? And I said, I'll let you know. So I flew to California. He picked me up. We went for a drive. He said, my grandfather killed somebody in the plantation. He shot him and killed him. But he was very, very wealthy. So they didn't touch him. They let him go. And he said, he bothers me a lot. And he said, but why did you ask? I said, that blood is still crying for vengeance. And I said, you need to do something about the cry of that blood. Because he's demanding vengeance. Look at the scripture. Let me show you a scripture. Jonah. Look at the book of Jonah. Jonah 1, 12, and then Hosea 7, 1, and we'll pray. And he said unto them, uh -huh. Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. Uh -huh. So shall the sea be calm unto you. Uh -huh. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. You see, there was a thorn in the ship or in the boat. Jonah, he was the cause of the turbulence and the storm. And the captain, as good and experienced as he was, he couldn't navigate the storm. And Jonah offered himself and said, Mr. Captain, I know you are very good and you are one of the best. But as long as I'm in this boat, the turbulence and the storm won't stop. Cast me out. And when he was thrown out, there was a great calm immediately. May every Jonah in your life and in your business be cast out. In the name of Jesus, say yes. Somebody say yes. Hallelujah. I command every Jonah in your life and in your marriage and in your business to leave right now. I command the Jonah to leave this house, to leave your ministry, to leave your business, to leave your kids, to leave your loved ones. Put your hands and say, I command Jonah out.
Hear me. Hear me. Every time you are trying, you are traveling, eh? Whether with a car or a boat or with a plane, always pray and block any Jonah on your flight. And it's something I do. I pray a prayer. Anyone on board this flight carrying a curse that will endanger the safety of this journey, that will provoke any strange wind and weather and elements of the heavens or from the regions of the sea to trouble the safety of this journey and aircraft are intercept. And I command the curse to be suspended indefinitely. I block that curse and I bind the spirit operating the curse. You will not function in the power of Jesus' name until further notice. When I get to my destination and I walk out of the plane, I say, okay, you can go into effect now in the name of Jesus. Say, not at my watch, not at my watch. Not at my watch. You see, you have to be very deliberate about things. So, we Christians, then, we take too much for granted. We really do. Other religions, they don't play. Oh. I, was in a, I was in a certain African country. And there was this Jewish businessman. I was introduced to him. And when he heard I was an archbishop, he said, Archbishop, you need to talk to my rabbi. So he called his rabbi and said, I have archbishop, Duncan William, I want you to greet him. So we spoke. Very spiritual man. And then the rabbi told him in Hebrew that he's a good man. If you do business with him, you will succeed. So he told me in English that my rabbi said I can do business with you. And I thought about the whole thing. You know why he introduced me to his rabbi? He put me on FaceTime. I saw the rabbi and the rabbi saw me. The rabbi was checking me out. You Christian businessmen, you won't even want us to pray. You don't want us to even know about the deal, so you pay your tithes. And you know what he told me? He said, my rabbi is very, very loaded. We pay his bill. We buy him everything. We take care of him. And all he does is to pray for our businesses to go through. And the guy was doing some serious business in that country over a billion dollars. Huge. And he said, Archbishop, I want you to partner with me. And I say, I don't do business, but I'll introduce you to some people who do business. But the rabbi will check me out. The last time I met him, he said, my rabbi likes you. My rabbi, he likes you. Yeah. Go to Hosea chapter 7 and verse 1. Let's pray. When I would have healed Israel. 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 What does it mean? At your Kairos moment in life. At your hour of breakthrough. Something went wrong. Listen. Then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered. You see? He said, some error. Something that was done in the past, in the bloodline, that hasn't been addressed and dealt with. He said, at the hour of your breakthrough, it was brought up, it was discovered, it became an objection in the courts of heaven. And the, and the wickedness of Samaria, uh -huh. for they commit falsehood and the thief cometh in, yeah. and the troop of robbers spoileth without. I pray in the name of Jesus. That whatever you did wrong in the past or any error or iniquity in your DNA that will be deployed at the hour of your breakthrough to deny you in the name of Jesus let it be dismissed let it be cancelled say I command any charge any case any accusation held against me that will be brought up in the court of law, in the realms of the spirit, at the hour of my breakthrough, to deny me in the name of Jesus, I dismiss it on the account of the blood of Jesus. Open your mouth, put your hands together, dismiss it. I dismiss. 
I dismiss it. I dismiss the charge. I dismiss the case. I dismiss legal grounds. I dismiss every accusation. Every charge, every case held against me. My wife, my sons, my daughters, my grandchildren, my loved ones, my family, this house, home and abroad, I dismiss, case, dismiss, case, dismiss, case, dismiss. On the account of the blood of Jesus, case, dismiss. Hallelujah. Please stand on your feet, I'm true.